Well, good morning, Fair Oaks Church, and thanks again for joining us for worship together again online. We wanted to let you in on a few things before we get started with our service today. As some of you might have heard, the board and the staff are diligently working on a plan to safely reopen the church. As of now, we have not announced an official date, but we will keep you updated with more information starting early next week. Check out our Facebook, our website, and your email for more information that will soon be coming out. We are very excited to safely meet back with you in person. Please continue to be praying for wisdom as we finalize our plan for reopening. Well, as we go into our time of musical worship, I'd like to start off our service by reading from Psalm 113. Psalm 113 says this, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Well, what a great reminder for us to hear this morning. For some of you, your Bibles might have titled this psalm, Who is Like the Lord Our God? And I think this is a great heading for this psalm. And it's a great question to ask ourselves. Its opening is a call to the servants of the Lord to praise the Lord, to say hallelujah. From the rising to the setting of the sun, the Lord is to be praised. Meaning, God's majesty and his worth are never ceasing, and he deserves eternal praise and worship for who he is. The rest of this psalm reminds us that God is above all of the heavens and the nations, seated on his sovereign throne. But this psalm doesn't just stop here. We are reminded in the remaining verses of Psalm 113 that this majestic and almighty king, the Lord of lords, sees and cares for the weak and the poor and the helpless. He extends his hand of care and grace to those who reach out to him, who call upon his name. What a gracious, loving, and good God we serve. So now, if we go back to the beginning and we ask that same question, who is like the Lord our God? I hope you will come to the conclusion that the answer is no one. The God who has always been and will always be is seated on the throne over all. We can hope and trust in his plan and sovereign hand. Let's worship him together now. As 
a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God so So, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after me It's running after me Overwhelm 
goddess, the ancient of days. None above him, none before him, all of time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. the power, all the glory, I will trust in His name, for my God is the Ancient of Days. Though I may not see what the future Savior King, then my joy complete, standing face to face in the presence of the the power, all the glory, I will trust in His name, for my God is the Ancient of Days, for my God is the Ancient of Days. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead though the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ 
It has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my part and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can put our hope and trust in you, knowing that you are sovereign, that you are in control, that you are on the throne, seated above every nation, seated above the universe. You are omnipotent, all-powerful, And we know that there is nothing that is out of your hand, that is out of your control. And so we trust and seek your guidance, looking and longing to see what you are doing in this time. God, we know that you are working it, though, for your good, for the good of your church, for your glory. And so we we ask that we would see your church come back together stronger more passionate about your praise for your name, more passionate about loving one another and the community around us. So Father, we thank you for for your Holy Spirit that you have poured out onto the earth and that your spirit encourages your church and your spirit is with your church in the houses that are gathered for worship in this time. May your church be encouraged and uplifted. May we continue to trust and put our hope in you. And may you speak to us through your word. May it be life-changing and life-giving. We praise your name. We praise the name of your great son. And we pray in his name, Jesus. Amen.
Well, good morning, Fair Oaks Church. It's good to be with you this morning. My name is Chris Keeskin, and I'm one of the pastors over at Grace Bible Church in Pleasant Hill, and it's a pleasure to be able to be with you and to minister the word to you this morning as uh, you meet together in your homes, and, and I get to meet with, with Phil here in the sanctuary in your pulpit. Uh, it's a blessing to be able to open the word, even in these times where we have this strange situation of shelter in place, to be able to have technology that allows us to still minister the word is a, a good opportunity for us, and I hope that you're encouraged this morning. Well, as we begin, uh, I would like to just ask you a question, and that question is, how are you standing? How are you standing? Like in the midst of all of this, but just in life in general. Uh, It's a question that uh, Scripture addresses quite a few times for us. Oftentimes, we're told to stand in different ways and for different reasons. And so I want to explore that a little bit from the book of Philippians in chapter 4. As we do that, I'd like to begin with something that Jesus taught us in Matthew 7 at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Some words that I think are very uh, prevalent uh, for today, uh, really for every day, but uh, are good for us to hear this morning as we consider standing in the midst of what's going on in in our culture, in our world right now. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said these words. This is the end of his sermon. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. One of the things that I think we we learn from that and are encouraged uh, to remember from that uh, teaching of Christ at the end of his longest sermon is that we're supposed to listen to what he has to say. We're supposed to hear and apply his truth, his teachings to us, so that when the storms come, when the wind blows, we will be able to stand and we'll be able to stand firm because our feet are planted on the rock. They're not on the sand. If you've ever been to the beach, you know what that's like when you're, you're standing in the sand and the waves come in and the sand just starts kind of melting under your feet. It gives way. Christ is saying, if you stand on my words, I won't give way. You will have solid footing. As we begin our time exploring the word, let me just pray and ask God to bless our time together in his word. Father, we thank you for the blessings that we have in your son and through your son. We thank you for his teaching that reminds us that we are to stand firm on his teaching. God, we ask that as we open your word this morning, you would meet with us, that you would minister to us through your word, that we would be encouraged to be people that stand firm on the rock of Christ, not to give in to the temptations that the world offers of trying to put a foot on the sand, maybe keep one on the rock and one in the sand, but that we would stand firmly and only on Christ, trusting his word, trusting his teachings, and seeking to abide in those things. Bless our time together, we pray, in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Well, as we begin, what I'd like you to do, if you have your Bibles, is to open up to Philippians chapter 4. We'll be looking at the, the first seven verses mainly as we look at this question, how are you standing? How do we stand in this world, in this society right now and and past this pandemic? And and how do we apply Scripture in our lives in such a way that will be helpful to us as we move forward? Well, before I I read our text, what I'd like to do is just have you consider the things that Paul wrote in Philippians before chapter 4. Because he begins chapter 4 with the word, therefore which means that we have to ask what the therefore is there for and find out what it was that he's referring to as he uses that word of transition before he says what we're going to look at this morning. So if if you would just indulge me for a moment, let me run through the different things that Paul has taught us about the blessings that we have in Christ in chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Philippians. In chapter 1, we read these things that are blessings to us through Christ that God will finish the work that he started in us, that he fills us with righteousness through Christ. He uses our circumstances to advance the gospel. He will deliver us one way or another. If we die for the Christian, it's gain. 
if we live and we are alive, God has fruitful labor for us to do. So it gives us purpose, gives us meaning. Our opponents will be destroyed. And lastly, from chapter 1, we've been granted faith, and we've also been granted the opportunity to suffer for the sake of Christ. It's odd to think of suffering as a gift sometimes, but it is something that God says He has granted to us to further connect us with our Savior. In chapter 2, we read these things, that we will receive encouragement. We do receive encouragement, love, the Holy Spirit, affection, and sympathy through Jesus. We can think and we can act like Christ because we have His words and His teachings. Jesus gave us a great example to follow, and He also gave Himself to us. God is working in us to work out our lives of sanctification, of salvation. We can do everything without grumbling and complaining. Let me say that one again. We can do everything, like go through this pandemic, without grumbling and complaining. That's something that God tells us that we ought not to do. Chapter 2 also tells us that we can live as lights in the world, not live like the world. That we have genuine love and care for one another, at least we should have that. And that God grants us His mercy. And from chapter 3 we read Paul uh, telling us that through Christ we can truly worship God, we can glory in Jesus, and we don't have to try to place any confidence in the flesh, any confidence in worldly things. We, write, we, we read that Paul tells us we can consider everything as loss as compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Savior. We are given Christ's righteousness. We have hope of the resurrection. Jesus has made us His own. There's reward for living in Christ and for Christ. God reveals to us our wrong thinking and our immaturity, mainly through His Word, and He corrects that so we would become more Christ-like. God gives us examples to follow. God warns us about what our enemies are like. We are waiting for heaven and for Jesus' return when one day we will be glorified. So those are the things in chapters 1, 2, and 3 that Paul has taught already about what we have in Christ, why we should stand firm, what reasons do we have to be able to stand firm in Christ during this time. And that brings us into our text now, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Let me read that. So then Paul says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is a great little passage for us to unpack this morning. And what I'd like to do is, is have, it, have it be unpacked in five points that I want to make, all dealing with how it is that we stand uh, for Christ, in Christ, with Christ. The first one being that we are called in, in verse 1 to stand firm. Paul, as he begins this, this last chapter of this letter, he reiterates to the Philippians his love for them, his care for them. He calls them, my brothers whom I love and I long for. Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. He tells them in basically three different ways. I love you guys. I care for you guys. You're my brothers. You're my joy. You're my crown. He, he illustrates clearly his love for them. And based on what he's taught them already about Christ and his own love for them as, as a pastor and as an apostle, he's now going to urge them to do several things in this, in this text. The first one being to stand firm in the Lord. As, as he calls us to stand firm, the, the word that Paul uses there is it's a single word in the Greek that says basically to be stationary, to persevere, to endure. And he's calling them to do that. Remember that Paul, as he writes this, he's in the midst of prison. That's where he's writing from. And he's calling them to be enduring, to be persevering, just like he's doing. 
We see that example in Christ. As Christ went through his trials, his mock trials, his, his death, his, his scourging, the whipping, going to the cross, he endured all of these things unjustly. And he stood firm. And Paul is calling us to stand firm, to be stationary in our faith, to persevere, to endure in our faith. And he, he tags it with, in the Lord reiterating the things that he's already taught to them about Christ, what he's already preached to them about, all the blessings that we have in Jesus. These are our reasons to stand firm. And we have to be careful, brothers and sisters, not to stand firm in worldly things. It's very easy for us to be caught up in the temptation to trust our 401k or our retirement plan, to trust in the plans that we have laid out for our families, to trust in, in governments doing the things that we hope that they will do, uh, trusting in the economy. There are all kinds of ways that the world will try to draw us in to trust worldly things and not trust in Christ, not trust in God. But if God is truly sovereign, as the Bible teaches he is, and if he is the ruler of all things, and if he is the one who sways the hearts of kings, we would be foolish to trust in anything or anyone other than God. And so Paul tells us, stand firm, persevere in the Lord, not any place else. Just as Jesus taught in, in Matthew 7, you're wise if you listen to my words, if you plant your feet in and on me. You're foolish if you don't. There's not a lot of wiggle room in there, is there? There's, there's not a, a place where Jesus says, you know, you can have a little, little bit of trust in me, a little bit of trust in the world, that's okay. He doesn't say that. Other places he says, you can't have two masters. It doesn't work that way. We have to be people who are committed to just trusting in the Lord. In the next verses, verses two and three, I wanna look at us standing side by side. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you have anybody in your life right now that you're not really getting along with, that you would rather not maybe see them or speak to them for maybe a couple days or maybe a week Maybe it's somebody in your family who's just getting on your nerves right now because you've been sheltered in place for a couple of months with them. Um, is there someone that's bugging you? Well, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be uh, fun for all of us if I just called you guys out by name to the whole congregation? That's kind of what Paul does here. Paul's writing this letter to be read to the congregation of the church in Philippi, and he names two women. And he says, these two ladies are not getting along. Well, we probably wouldn't enjoy that. We probably wouldn't like that, having, having our dirty laundry aired in front of the congregation. But Paul does that, and he does it for a purpose. And what he does is he begs these two ladies, Yodia and Syntyche, he begs them, he says, I urge you, I entreat you, I implore you. He's, he's speaking directly to them through his letter. He says, I urge you, agree in the Lord. Agree in the Lord. The word he uses there, agree, means to think the same thing, to think, think the same way. And the way that we do that is by submitting our minds, our thoughts to what the scriptures teach. Sometimes what causes, usually what causes tensions between us and, and, and difficulties and breaks in our relationships are our personal preferences, our personal desires, things that we want that somebody else isn't doing or isn't doing the way we want them to or we think they should. That's a lot of times what will cause our, our difficulties in our relationships. And if you, if you go back and, and look at uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, where Paul said, we ought to be people who are considering the needs of others ahead of the needs of ourselves. We should be caring for their desires ahead of our own. If we're practicing that, Paul says that's, that's having the mind of Christ. So if we are to think the same thing in the Lord, we are to think the same way, Basically, what Paul is doing with these two women is he's saying, remember what I said two chapters ago? You two need to practice that. You need to consider each other's needs first. Put each other's desires ahead of your own. It's amazing how that will stop conflict. If we're caring for one another more than we're caring about ourselves, our own desires, our own wants, our own preferences, we're gonna get along better with people. We, we see that displayed in Scripture. We see that taught here. It's a good way for us to really remember that we can, we can uh, deal with our broken relationships by submitting our minds to Christ, submitting our minds to the word 
and then, and then acting on what we, are, what we are being taught through the Scriptures. It's a great way that we express loving and caring for one another. And then Paul continues on, and he asks the whole church, guys, will you step in and, and help these women? Help them to get along. Help me to help them. He, he urges the whole church to not be passive and just sit by while probably everybody knows what's going on. I, I assume that Paul mentioned these ladies because he's heard what's going on with them from, from the messenger that brought him information about, about the Philippians from Epaphroditus. And he's heard because they're talking about it. The Philippian church is talking about the problem that's going on. I assume that's why Paul heard about it. And so what he does is he urges the church to not be passive, but to be involved in helping these ladies to get along, helping them to resolve whatever conflict it is that they're having. And I think there's a really good lesson in that for us is we ought to be people who when we see our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, not getting along, we're seeing them in conflict in some way, we shouldn't be just people who gossip about that, who just talk about, oh, hey, did you see and did you hear and you know what she did and you know what he did? And that shouldn't be how we res- how that should not be how we respond to that type of a situation. What we ought to do is we ought to seek to come alongside these people that are in conflict, that are having disagreements, and, and bring about healing, bring about a, a, a healing of that relationship through the teachings of the Word so that they can agree in the Lord, in their thinking, and come to a point where they can agree to disagree about whatever differences they have, but come together in Christ. And, and, bring, and bring about healing to that brokenness that has separated them and bring them back together in the Lord. As the church, that's part of what we ought to be doing with each other. Not in, a, not in a, an overbearing way, not in an authoritarian way, not in a threatening way, but as Paul has done here, in a loving way, in a caring way. And part of the reason that he says, I want you to be doing this, church, is because he says, in the next sentence, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. He says, these ladies have, part of their life, part of their goal is they want to be working for the sake of the gospel. And if that's their desire, if there's conflict, that's going to interfere with the work of the gospel. And so Paul is saying, for the, for the sake of the gospel of Christ, help each other to get along, help each other to heal those broken, broken relationships that we have. And we all have them. Everyone has them. There's difficulties that we all, di- all face in different ways with different people. And by us submitting ourselves to what Christ teaches us will help us to not completely eliminate all of those because we still struggle with sin. We'll still have some brokenness that will go on. We'll, we may be in, in difficult situations with people who just have no interest in making things right. But for people who are gospel-centered, gospel-thinking, we have to always be striving to pull our relationships together and to be getting along, agreeing together in the Lord for the sake of the gospel of Christ. In the third section, in verse 4, I want to point out how Paul calls us to stand joyfully. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice Now, this is the 12th and the 13th out of 14 times that Paul speaks about joy in four chapters to the Philippians. This is his letter of joy, as some people have called it. Paul is very adamant that this church be joyful. Paul expresses his joy a number of times. And remember, where's he writing from? He's writing from prison. And if Paul can be joyful in prison, you and I can be joyful in shelter in place. Um, I guarantee you our homes are probably a lot nicer than what Paul's having to deal with in prison. And he's in a position where he can be joyful in that because he knows that God is in charge. He knows that God is ruling all things. He knows that the Lord is working. He's shared earlier in chapter 1 that the gospel, despite me being in prison, the gospel is being proclaimed. And it causes him joy. Sometimes what we have to do is we have to We have to kind of fight through some of the mess to find the joy, the reasons for us to be joyful in Christ. It's very easy for us to get bogged down in worldly things that will will steal our joy. 
All we have to do is turn on the television, watch the news for a while, just watch a few commercials and let them tell you how you are missing out on life because you don't have their product. That's all it, that's all it takes sometimes, is just giving in to the thoughts and the temptations that the world may set out before us saying, you know, your life will be a lot better if you have this policy or if you have this house or if you get this car or if you get this thing. Paul tells us to rejoice in the Lord. That's a very precise command, isn't it? He doesn't say rejoice because of the circumstances that you find yourself in. He doesn't say rejoice because the government made the decision you wanted them to make or your, the vote went the way you wanted it to go. He doesn't say to rejoice because America is the land of the free and the home of the brave. He doesn't say to rejoice in anything worldly. He commands us, rejoice in the Lord. Well, if we're going to rejoice in the Lord, what does that imply for us? It implies that we need to know the Lord, first of all, but we also need to know about the Lord. That's why I read to you the different things that are blessings that we have in Christ from chapters 1, 2, and 3, is because if we are being called to rejoice in Christ, we need to know why. We need to know the reasons. That's a great reason why we should be people who are studying Scripture, who are looking at His Word wanting to know, why should I have joy in Christ? And then we're reminded, oh yeah, there's a lot of reasons why I should have a whole lot of joy in Christ. One of the biggest ones is that my sins have been paid for and I'm promised heaven. One of the things that I, I teach our students and I remind them of oftentimes in our youth ministry is, is the idea of to live for the line, not for the dot. And what I mean by that is I'll, I'll, on a whiteboard or something, I'll draw a little dot uh, up, at, up at the top of the board and across the board I'll draw a line that just goes this way with an arrow at the end that just keeps pointing off into eternity. The dot represents our life here on earth. It's very short, it's very small. The line represents eternity, represents heaven, our life with Christ after this life. And the, the idea is to not get caught up living for the dot, trying to make the dot awesome because the dot will never be as awesome as the it, the eternity of the line is. And as, as Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, that if we're in Christ, we're to set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on this earth. That's going to affect how we, how we live here, how we think here, how we respond here, how we act here. We live for the line, not for the dot. That's part of how we learn how to rejoice. Because think about it, if, if, if we're called to rejoice based on what's happening in the world, there's not a whole lot of reason to rejoice. All we have to do is just look around the world. We see conflict. We see the results of sin. We see death. We see all kinds of things that are happening. And there's a lot of reason for despair if all we do is look at the world. But if we look at Christ, we see the beauty and the majesty and the glory and the promises and the hope and all that is in Christ, we have every reason to rejoice. We have every reason to find joy that is unquenchable joy that is unspeakable, joy that doesn't come from this world, joy that you don't find going to Disneyland and find that there's nobody else there but you and you get on any ride you want. That's not where our joy comes from. He says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I will say rejoice. And he says, always, always. He doesn't say, take time off when things are going bad. He doesn't say to us, rejoice on Sunday mornings when you're together with the church body. He says rejoice in the Lord always, in all of our circumstances. That can be hard, I understand. But what we're compelled to do is we're compelled to find why we ought to rejoice even in our hardest of trials. James talks about it in chapter 1 when he begins his letter and says, consider it all joy when you meet various trials. Why does he say that? Because he continues, he says, the Lord is using those things to complete us, to, to perfect us. So God uses even our trials for good purposes. And James says, man, have joy in that. Have joy in what God is doing, even through your difficulties. But see, for us to find that joy, to have that joy, we have to be thinking correctly. We have to be thinking biblically. We have to think rightly about those things. Oftentimes, when you hit a trial, when I hit a trial, what's our first reaction? God, please take this away. Please make this, make this go away. Make this stop. Get me out of this mess. 
A lot of times that's how we will pray. And it's okay to pray that, but we ought to pray that in the same way that Jesus prayed that in the garden. Uh, Many of you will remember as he he knelt in prayer, he asked the Lord, if there's any other way, remove this cup from me. But there wasn't a stop there. He said, but not my will, but your will be done. And that's how we ought to pray in our difficult times. God, if if it's your will, take this away. If there's any other way for me to be made more like Christ than going through this trial, take this trial away. But if it's your will that I go through it, then I'll go through it. See, that, that needs to be our heart too. That's exemplified for us in Christ, in the garden, in the hardest of trials. I guarantee you there is no trial that you or I will ever face that will be as difficult as what Jesus went through in going to the cross in being separated from the Father, in enduring the the wrath because of sin that he did, we will never know the depth of suffering that he experienced. But he gave us an example to submit ourselves, our will, to God's will, even when we're asking for the way out. Knowing that in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he has promised to help us endure, to go through whatever he's brought into our lives. The way of escape that Paul refers to in that verse, the way of escape, not a way, but the way, is Christ. It's through Christ. It's in the Lord. That's how we endure. That's how we get through. That is where we find our joy. It's rooted in our relationship to Jesus and all the blessings found in him. The next point, the next verse, verse 5, I want to call our attention to the idea of standing reasonably, or your version may say gently. This is something I think is very helpful for us just right now with what we're going through uh, in this season of of our country, what's going on in the world with this pandemic. Paul urges them to be reasonable, to be gentle. And he says that he desires for that gentleness, that reasonableness. He says, let it be known to everyone the Lord is at hand. What he's calling us to is to have our reasonableness, our gentleness, despite whatever circumstances we're in, be known to everyone. That word known means to be perceived or to be understood. So that means when you're talking with somebody on social media, or when you're discussing some of these different things that are going on with this pandemic with other people, that your desire ought to be that they will know that you are a gentle, and reasonable person. Not that we're flying off the handle, just calling people names and saying, you're wrong and I'm right and here's the stats and here's the data. And That should not be how we engage with people. We should be engaging with them so that everyone, all men will know, they'll see, they will perceive, they'll understand our reasonableness, our gentleness. Social media is an easy place to let that go. And so I just want to encourage you to, when you get on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, you, whatever platform you may use, um, or if you're just, you know, talking to people out there in whatever capacity, allow this to be something that governs your tongue, your thoughts, how you engage with people. Because what he's saying is that he wants this to be seen by everyone in part because the Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. God is watching. When you and I go out into this world in any capacity, we're representing him, aren't we? We are called to be his witnesses, those who testify to Christ in every capacity. And we can't separate uh, something like this pandemic from our spiritual life. We can't put that over here in a box and say, well, when I'm talking about the pandemic, I'm not worried about Jesus. When we talk about that, we should be always worried and thinking about Jesus and how does our relationship to Christ affect how we view even the the things that are coming out from this whole pandemic. We can view it in a a panic and an anxious and worrisome, fearful manner, but the scriptures call us to not be be fearful. Scriptures call us to not be anxious for anything, to not worry about tomorrow. Scriptures say things like that. Well, how can that be? How can we not be fearful, not be anxious, not be worried? It's because of Christ. Jesus taught that. The apostles taught that. that 
our, our hope needs to be placed so firmly in Him that no matter what comes, we are able to stand amidst the storm, amidst the, the seas beating up against the house that we're building. We're on the rock, and we stand firm, and the house doesn't fall because we're, we're founded on Jesus. That's how we not be fearful. That's how we not be anxious. That's how we fight against worry is we trust in a God who's sovereign and who is ruling everything, who's overseeing all the affairs of man. Do you think this pandemic snuck up on God, caught him by surprise somehow? That all of a sudden, he, he, you know, one of the angels came to him and said, hey, uh, uh, God, there's a, something going on in China. It's spreading all around the world now. Do you think that's what happened? It's not what happened. The, the scriptures tell us that, that God uses everything according to his will, plan, and purpose that all things are happening according to him. In some way, God's using this for his purpose. I don't know what that is, but I know that the scriptures tell me I can trust God that he's, he's doing what he says he's doing. He doesn't tell us, I'm gonna give you all the details about everything that I'm doing. One of my favorite verses from Habakkuk is when God tells Habakkuk, I could tell you my plans, Habakkuk. I could tell you my plans, and you wouldn't understand them. It's reflective when, when God told Isaiah, look, here's your plans, here's my plans. Here's your ways, here's my ways. My ways are so far above yours. My plans are so far above yours. And Habakkuk, he says, I, I could tell you what I'm going to do. You wouldn't get it. That would be the same for us today. You know, we might in our pride think, well, if, if God told me, I would understand because I've read the New Testament. Habakkuk didn't have that. We could easily say something like that, but it wouldn't be true because God's thoughts, his, his mind is so far above ours. He can even tell us what he's doing. And what we might do is say, well, you know what, God, I think, I think that's not the best way. I think we need to do it a different way. We might come up with that. Um, imagine if you were with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before God created everything. You got to be at the table when, when God said, hey, we're going to create man. And man's going to fall into sin Guys, what do we do when that happens? And, and God the Father turns to you and says, what do you suggest? I very much doubt that your first suggestion will be, well, let's kill Jesus. I don't think that would be your thought, your plan as to how to deal with man's sin. But that was the Father's plan, was to crush his own son because of man's sin for the sake of God then bringing glory to himself and exaltation to his son. See, our, our plans, though we might think are really good, sometimes they are not so good. That's why God calls us to trust him, trust his plans, trust his will. And brothers and sisters, that's partly why we can be very reasonable and very gentle when we are dealing with people. He's just talked about Yodia and Syntyche and the problems that they're having and in a way, he's probably urging them, ladies, be reasonable with each other. Be gentle with each other. Because it's easy just to get in a nice little conflict and choose up sides and get your people and get your people, and now we're going to go at it. Sometimes it's harder to do what is humble and to consider somebody else before you, to put your preferences aside or put them down, and lay them down, and let Christ rule in and through you. Some of the ways that we see the reasonableness, the gentleness of God is by being merciful towards each other, by being patient with each other, showing one another grace, um, the contentment that we have in Christ. All of those are ways that we show to the world and, and to those that are around us in church our reasonableness, our gentleness. And he's not talking here, I, I just want to reiterate this, he's not just saying show that to the people that agree with you. That's easy. He's not just saying, show that to those who are your friends. He says, show it to all men. It's, it's reminiscent of when Jesus said, um, if you love those who love you, what good is that? I tell you, love your enemies. That is where it gets challenging. See, that's part of what Paul's saying here is, you let this gentleness, this reasonableness, you let it be known to all men, to all men, not just those who are on your side or who you, who you agree with or who agree with you. The last point, point five from verses six and seven, Paul urges us to stand in peace, to stand in peace. 
He wants us to be at peace, the peace that comes from God, not from the world. He says that very clearly when he says that, that he, in verse, uh, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. He says, don't be anxious about anything. This is one of those verses that everybody knows about it, but it's hard to do it. And when I was talking about one of those verses I was talking about just a few minutes ago, how is it that we can not be anxious? It's by having the peace of God, by having rest in Christ, by trusting in God and what he's doing and his will. Do you think that, that God's will will not be accomplished? Job tells us, no one can thwart your will. No one. God's will will be accomplished, period, or exclamation point. It will. We can trust that. Jesus trusted that. Jesus lived a life trusting that. He knew that. Hebrews tells us that he went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. He knew exactly what would happen as a result of him going to the cross because he trusted the Father. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Right? He trusted his Father to do his will, to accomplish his will. Do you trust God that much? We all can struggle with that. But I want to encourage you to trust God that much so you don't have to be anxious for anything. Didn't get your stimulus check yet? Well, don't be anxious. Unemployment hasn't kicked in because you lost your job because of all this. Don't be anxious. Trust God. Look for his means of grace. Look for the reasons to be joyful. Let your, let your requests be made known to him. And if necessary, let them be made known to the church. If you're struggling, don't hold that in by yourself. The church is given to each other. We're, we're given to one another to help each other, to encourage each other, to lift each other up when we're fallen. If you have a burden, share that with people in your congregation. Let those people help you. I'm sure there are, there are people in your congregation who are ready and eager and very willing to step in and help you when you have a need. Well, let them. That's part of the ministry that God has for them. It's part of the care that they can give to you. And when you are in the position to give that to others, freely do that and make that known that you're ready to step in and to help other people. That's part of how we can alleviate anxiety because God's people are rising up, helping God's people, loving for and caring for one another. It's a great testimony to the world when Jesus said, they will know you are Christians by your love for one another. That's exactly what he meant. It's one of the things that we, we see that pictures that for the world, that we love and care for one another. We don't look at, oh, there's Joe over there. Oh, he's really fallen. <laughs> Hope he gets back up. That, that, that's not how we treat Joe or whoever. We actually, we, we want to go. We want to help him back to his feet. We want to help him back up. That's a great testimony that the church should be practicing that on a regular basis. It, it helps to alleviate our anxiety. Isn't, isn't it good to know, wouldn't it be great to know that if, if you're really hurting, you can just call your church and your church will be gathered around you to help you out? That's a great testimony. It's a great source of comfort and hope because we have people around us that love and care for each other. Part of that requires us to be open with our needs. Part of that needs to, means that we have to be ready to meet other people's needs when they're made known to us. And that we're not the people that, that Paul writes about that say, oh, I, I hear your problems, but oh, I'll pray for you. Go be warm and filled. That, that's not how we respond to each other. But we respond to each other with love and care. It's part of the way that God brings peace. Part of what Paul tells us in the text uh, in regards to the how do we find that lack of anxiety, how do we find that peace, is through prayer, offering thanksgiving, and trusting in God. It's, it's amazing to me how many times God talks about our thanksgiving. In Romans 1, for example, Paul says that, uh, that part of God's wrath is being brought because men suppress the truth about God, but also because they don't thank him. Did you know that? That part of God's wrath comes because people are thankless to him? Here, Paul says that we ought to be thankful to God. He says, by, but in everything, you want, you want no anxiety? In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Why with thanksgiving? Because you are praying 
to a God who not only hears you and listens to you as, as his child, but he loves you and he cares for you. He knows what's going on in your situation or the situation of others better than you or I know what's going on in their situations, and he is the one who can act. You could pray to anybody else, and they may be absolutely powerless to do anything to help, but God is never powerless. God is always able to help. He is always available. He is always ready, and he does everything according to his will. And if helping somebody is part of his will and he, his desire for you is to pray for that so that you see the blessing of praying and the outcome of that in your life and they get the blessing of receiving God's help, all praise is due to God then, right? It gives us more reason to rejoice, more reason to, to find joy and to find peace in Christ because of what he does. Paul tells us that this kind of peace of God is, is beyond our understanding. He says, it surpasses all understanding. Sometimes the world may say to us, well, how can you have peace in the midst of all this craziness that's going on? Well, the, the reason that we can is because of Jesus. Because we know the one who is reigning and ruling right now. We know the one who is in charge. We know that he's going to accomplish his purpose. We know that we're living in the dot. It's a pretty short time. The line's coming. Heaven is promised. Resurrection will happen. There's a lot of reasons for us to have peace. And for all of those things, we can be very thankful. That's why sometimes the world just won't understand it. That's why Jesus said, I bring you a peace that the world can't bring you. I bring you a peace with God that puts everything else into a different perspective. The world can't bring that kind of peace, no matter how hard they try. They cannot give that peace. They don't know that peace. They don't understand that peace. It's beyond their capacity. Even for us as Christians sometimes, we may look at people and say, and, and say I don't know how they got through that. I couldn't have gotten through that because the peace of God ruled in their heart, in their mind. It guarded their heart and their mind, just as Paul says it will do. And sometimes it's hard for us to envision that we might be able to, to sus be sustained through a, a hard, difficult situation like other people have gone through. Yet what the writer of Hebrews tells us is that God gives us grace for the time of need. It might be difficult to imagine going through a difficulty that you would never want to face. But God says, when you, ha when you have need for my grace and you, you need it to go through that, I'll give you the grace that you need to endure that. He doesn't tell us, I'm gonna, I'm gonna prep you with enough grace so that you'll feel like, I'm ready, I can handle anything. That's not the kind of grace that God gives, that's not the way that God gives us his grace. What would that probably do for us if, if we just were pumped up with God's grace all the time? We're like, I'm ready for everything. We'd be so prideful. We'd be so boastful probably. I, I can do anything, I can do, endure anything. All kinds of things might go wrong. But God says, when you have the need, I'll give you what you need. And that's how we can look at somebody, especially a brother or sister in Christ who's gone through a really hard time and see how they, even in the midst of that, were able to rejoice in God and find joy in Christ despite whatever may have been hurting them in their lives. And that's a challenge for us to strive to find that, to strive to know that peace. And he, he closes by saying that that peace of God will be with you. He says it will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, or as we've been saying, in the Lord, founded on the rock, standing on, on firm ground, on solid ground. As we close, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to read the next few verses that Paul wrote as we, as we bring the sermon to an end this morning. Paul writes in verse eight these words. He says, finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have, received your, you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. 
Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned. Listen to what Paul says here. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Sometimes that verse is, is misquoted and misused to say, I can jump off a building and live and crazy things. In the context of what Paul is talking about here, he is saying, all these things I've commended you with to stand firm, to stand side by side, stand joyfully, stand reasonably, stand in peace, be content, you find that in Christ. You can do all of that in Christ who gives you the strength to do that, the wisdom to do that. He's given us the teaching that we need. He's given us his spirit who resides in us, who can take his word and work it out in and through our lives. We have so many reasons to rejoice, so many things that have gone right in our lives because of Jesus. We may go through hard times, and we will here in this world, but remember, it's the dot. The line is coming, and the line is forever. That's a long line. That's what we ought to live for. That's what we ought to strive for. Paul says in those first few verses I read as we concluded, to think about these things that are, that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. Who is more those things than Jesus? No one and nothing. I think what Paul is, is encouraging us to do here is to set our minds on Christ, just as he, as he does in Colossians 3. Set your minds there. Think about Jesus. One of, the, one of the things I, I often use, a, a statement I'll use with our students often, is the way you think affects the way you act. And it always does. How you're thinking, how you're processing things will affect how you respond to those things. It will always do that. Our, our thought life, God addresses very often in Scripture. How we guard our mind, how we think, how we renew our, our mind, renew our thinking how we set our minds on, on things above. There are so many verses that speak about that. Paul says, think about these things and then practice what you've heard from me. Practice them. Put them in your brain and let them come out your body. Think them and then act them. Put them in and let them come out. You guys have probably all heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out. Well, godly in, godly out. I'm not talking about Phil but about Jesus. Because as we fill our minds with him and we seek to practice what he's taught us, we will be more like him. We will honor him more with our lives. We'll be more at peace. We'll have greater joy. We'll be laboring side by side for the gospel. We will be standing firm in our faith and we'll be gentle and reasonable with people as we interact with them. All of those things will be a part of our Christian experience, our Christian life together. So learn about these things. Learn what it means to stand on the rock. Learn what it means to put your feet firmly on Christ, not on the sand, not one foot on the sand, one on the rock. Uh, Revelation's clear. If you're lukewarm, God spits you out of his mouth. He does not want us to be wavering between worldliness and godliness. He wants us founded, rooted, planted deeply, firmly in and on Christ. So I encourage you, just think about your life especially as we're going through this time of pandemic. Uh, we all have a lot of time to think, a lot of time to stew, a lot of time we can be grumpy or grumble or complain, but we're not supposed to grumble and complain about anything. So think about these things. Let it be what rules your life. Let Christ be what rules you, who leads you, and where you're standing. And when we practice these things together, what we end up doing is building each other up and encouraging each other as we seek to grow in Christ together. Amen? Well, let me close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together in your word this morning. We thank you for Paul who wrote this letter, Lord, from prison and yet had so much joy in this letter, so many things to say to encourage us to live a, a Christ-like life. Lord, we thank you for the teachings of Jesus that call us to be people who build our houses on the rock to, to live our lives firmly planted in him. 
And Father, we thank you for these different aspects of what we've looked at about standing just in this, these few verses this morning. And Lord, I pray for this church. Lord, I pray that you would bring them a, a pastor soon. I know they're without that. And I pray, God, you'd be merciful to them and bring the right person to them. Lord, I pray that you would work in all of our lives so that we would be people who are standing firm in Christ, that we would be working together side by side for the gospel. God, that you would be filling us with your joy, with your peace. And as we go out and live in this world, that all men would see our, our reasonableness, our gentleness, because of the gospel. Lord, may that be what we think about and what impacts our lives. All for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. Lord, may you and your son be glorified in the ways that we think, in the ways that we act and live. All for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the kingdom, we pray these things. Amen.